Hello, and welcome to the League of Women Voters Forum for Candidates for City Commissioner. My name is Linda Mather, and I will be the forum moderator. The League is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making democracy work. We believe democracy works best when voters are informed about issues and engaged in their communities. We are presenting this forum to give Portland voters the opportunity to learn about these two candidates, Chloe Udaly and Mingus Maps. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't hold these in-person candidate events as we used to. I'm joining you from Metro East Community Media Studio while our candidates are participating from their own locations. We are grateful for support from the Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Fewing Fund, and our media partner, Media East Community Media. Some of the guidelines, and they are mainly because of time constraints. So each candidate will give a two minute opening statement and they will have 90 seconds to answer questions. Each will also have a two minute closing. We have lots of issues to cover, so I've asked the candidates to adhere to the allotted time. As determined by coin toss, Ms. Udaly will give the first opening statement and then we'll continue to alternate through all the questions. So I think we're ready. And Ms. Udaly, if you give us your first opening statement, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Chloe Udaly and I'm running for re-election to Portland City Council position number four where I proudly serve our city as the eighth woman to ever be elected to Portland City Council. I was born and raised in the Portland metro area and I've called Portland proper my home since 1988. I came of age as an activist during the first Gulf War, which set me on a lifelong path of activism and advocacy. Before taking my seat, I owned a bookstore for 22 years and co-founded the IPRC, a maker's space for writers, artists, and self-publishers. I also co-founded the district-wide special education PTA of Portland to give families like mine, raising kids with disabilities, a voice at the school district. I've devoted my life to amplifying unheard voices and standing up for underrepresented communities, but it was my involvement in the housing justice movement and my personal experience as a cost burden renter that led me to run for and win my seat on city council. I'm inspired by what, by what my team and I have been able to accomplish working hand in hand with community in the past four years in housing, transportation, climate, social equity, and restorative justice. It would be an honor to serve my city for four more years. I look forward to the conversation this afternoon. Thank you. And thank you, and Mr. Maps. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having us here today. I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk about this important race. My name is Mengus Maps. I'm running for Portland City Council. Uh, um, I wanna tell you why I'm running. I'm, I'm in this race because I love Portland. Um, at the same time, I'm deeply concerned about the direction our city is heading in. I think we all know the problems. We have COVID, economic collapse. Our schools have been closed for nearly seven months wildfires, climate change, racial strife, uh, policing crisis, homelessness, um, high housing costs, and sometimes it feels like City Hall is just broken. Um, negotiating this extraordinary collection of challenges will require extraordinary leadership, and that's also why I'm in this race. I believe I have the background and vision needed to get Portland back on track. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a single dad, I'm a Democrat, I'm a progressive and I'm pragmatic. I have deep roots in Portland. I did my undergraduate work at Reed College and then went on to get a PhD in government from Cornell University. I've split my career between being an academic where I teach on issues surrounding race and urban politics and being a uh, public servant here in Portland. I've held policy making positions at the city of Portland, Multnomah County and Portland Public Schools. Experiences like that have taught me a lot about how Portland Portland works, why it doesn't work, and how we can make Portland a city that works again. 
When I'm on city council, my uh, um, agenda will be pragmatic um, and progressive. I think we need to focus on COVID um, recovery, racial justice, police reform, homelessness, and affordable housing. I also think it's time that we fundamentally reinvent and re reform the way uh, City Hall works. That's why I, why I want to expand the number of seats on council. I want to change the way we fill those seats, and I want to direct City Council to hire a city, man uh, a city manager to coordinate services across uh, different bureaus. If this is your version or your vision for Portland 2, I hope you will consider voting for Mengus Maps. Okay, now you're going to need to take a break because you're going to get the first question, or at least a breath, I guess I should say. Okay. So, and we all know the 90 seconds are difficult, so let's just get right to it. Sure. What is the city's single biggest problem, and how do you propose to address it? Um, that goes to me? Yes, it does. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, at this point, I think we have to um, point towards COVID uh, because everything else is tied up with COVID. COVID uh, pre presents a devastating public health crisis, which has also shut down our economy, which has also shut down our schools, which has also triggered a um, housing crisis, which has caused our, um, which has caused, you know, the number of houseless folks uh, who, who are sleeping on our streets to skyrocket. I recently did a walk through the Pearl District and counted 180 tents um, um, on the sidewalks uh, um, and I've talked to business owners and residents down there who say this is just an untenable position. Um, I think that we need to um, I think we need to come together as a city to focus on uh, keeping everyone healthy, uh, making sure um, and then helping people get back to their lives in a way that keeps uh, everyone safe. Uh, that's what I that's what I'll focus on in city council. I'm deeply concerned about um, our houseless uh, residents uh, who are on the streets right now as um, as winter heads in. I think it's very important that we open up our public spaces to get them inside and to connect them to the services that will help them uh, stay healthy. And then I hope to help local businesses open up again in a safe way. Thank you, Ms. Udaly. Biggest problem. Thanks for the question. Well, it, it's hard to choose. We have a lot of problems. Uh, our most existential threat, of course, is climate change, as we're currently witnessing or recently witnessed with multiple fires burning in our state and some of the worst air quality in the world. Uh, typically, the most visible and costly issue impacting Portland is our housing crisis whether it's homelessness or the profound lack of affordable housing for low and moderate income Portlanders and the impact that has, not just on individual households, but local business and economy. However, in this moment of a global pandemic, economic crisis and national uprising against police brutality, with all of our systemic failures on display and hundreds of millions of Americans suffering, I believe the biggest challenge we face in Portland and as a nation is systemic racism. This is not to say that inequity and injustice do not impact white people, but when we see the way that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted black, indigenous and Latino communities, the BIPOC communities have diminished outcomes across the board in education, economic opportunity, income and wealth gaps, arrest and incarceration, health and longevity, it is undeniable that racism is at the root of so many of our social ills. Racial justice has informed every major policy solution my office has uh, undertook and uh, advanced in the last few years, four years from housing to transportation to civic engagement and the environment. We have centered the least well represented and least well served in our community, deliver policies that do the most good for the most people and build a more equitable and just community for all. Thank you. And we'll hope that we can elaborate more on that as we move forward. All of these issues and COVID on top of it costs money. So describe the factors you believe are important. And Ms. Udaly, you'll start us on this one. Factors you believe are important in considering any proposals to cut city programs for budgetary reasons. Sure. Well, early on uh, in the shutdown, we took swift action as a city and certainly my office and my bureaus to minimize all non-essential spending and uh, implement cost saving measures to preserve programs and positions. I'm really pleased to say that at least with uh, my bureaus, 
we're not going to see significant programmatic or personnel cuts this fiscal year. Uh, I will bring a very strong equity lens to any uh, future conversations about budget and personnel program and personnel cuts. We've made some strides towards equity and diversity uh, internally at the city of Portland, but I'm very determined that we don't lose those gains uh, as we face as we face these uh, really hard decisions and cuts. Thank you, and Mr. Mapes? Maps, sorry. Don't worry about it. Uh, an important issue, indeed, I think the next council is gonna spend uh, a lot of energy um, focusing in on how do we cut budgets and also providing Portlanders with the services they need to survive this very trying time. My budget priorities going through this are to, um, uh, maintain basic uh, basic services to everyone, uh, promote economic recovery, and keep everybody safe. Um, I ha also have a couple of goals I want to focus on and focus dollars on. I think that um, no one should lose their housing because of this. This is the renters and homeowners. Um, and I think that no one should go hungry during this pandemic, so I will work with local service providers to make sure that everyone has access to both food and our kids have access to the internet so they can do their uh, um, school work. I also think Think that we're going to have to look at a wide range of cost-cutting um, strategies for the next budget cycle. Um, so we're going to be looking at everything from hiring freezes um, to adjusting the timelines for major capital projects. Um, I expect that we'll see a deep cut in management, at least under my leadership, we'll have a deep cut in management. Uh, pay raises are going to get delayed. Uh, we'll have to work with our labor partners to try to hold down um, um, expenses. And we'll have to, I think, fundamentally look at restructuring our form of government. Uh, and I'm excited to talk more about that uh, later on today. Okay, thank you. And we're gonna continue with you. If yeah. elected, for what bureau would you seek responsibility to administer and why? Sure. Well, the first bureau that I, I, I'm going to ask for is the Office of Civic Life. I used to be a manager over there, both in the Neighborhood Association System and the Crime Prevention Program. Um, I think this bureau is very important because it's the one that facilitates uh, community engagement. Uh, um, um, I think this bureau is also very important because it is famously troubled. Um, it pains me to say that this is one of the bureaus that has been managed by uh, Commissioner E. Daly, um, even as recently as a couple of weeks ago, we got a shocking memo from, from the ombudsman uh, warning us about, frankly, waste, fraud, and abuse in the Office of Civic Life. That breaks my heart. I understand where it comes from, though, and I think that it's time for that to change. So I hope under my leadership I can uh, take that office back to being what it should be again, helping keep communities safe and clean and Portlanders engage with their community. Um, instead of this being a source of strife and conflict in the city, I think the Office of Civic uh, Life could bring Portlanders together, uh, which is incredibly important at this trying moment. Um, that's the kind of leadership I'll bring. Those are the kind of values that um, drive my campaign. Um, and this is something we can actually get done. I know uh, the Civic Life, I know the Office of Civic Life quite well. We've got great people over there who frankly aren't doing very much because they are uh, burdened with uh, a broken system and a disengaged leadership um, and a set of community um, fights that um, I think serve no one well. Okay, thank you, Ms. Udaly. Thank you. Well, it's been interesting to hear uh, Mingus uh, characterize and mischaracterize not only my leadership of the Office of Community and Civic Life, but his role there, which was supervisory. Um, the bureaus that I'm more most passionate about uh, are the Bureau of Transportation, um, which I currently have. I've had it for about two years now. I was a little daunted by that assignment, having uh, no uh, real background or expertise in transportation. I immediately signed up for transportation and traffic class at PSU and really started uh, diving into the history of our transportation uh, system with all its uh, blessings and curses uh, and getting to know a lot of amazing community members who are really passionate about, about our transportation system. I have uh, been able to advance 
equity and racial justice and uh, climate goals and safety through this bureau, as well as the Rose Lane Project, which is a transformational public transit program that will make uh, public transit a more faster, more reliable and viable option for Portlanders across the whole city. Uh, should come as no surprise that I would also love to have the Portland Housing Bureau. It, uh, housing is the issue that I have worked the most on and my time is up. I'd also love BPS. Okay, thank you, you got it in there. Um, and we'll ask you to continue with, are you satisfied with Portland's climate for business? Yes or no, and obviously no, how would you seek to change it? Climate for business. Climate for business. Well, I mean, certainly this is an extraordinarily tough time for uh, business in Portland with the shutdowns and uh, the fires and our nightly protests against police violence and defense of black lives. But in general, uh, Portland is a fairly good place to do business. I owned a business here for 22 years. Uh, the loss of affordable housing is presenting a lot of challenges to Portland business owners. Uh, when your employees can't afford to live in the city that your business is in, when uh, your customers are spending the lion's share of their discretionary income on housing, it does, it does make it uh, tough. So there are a variety of challenges. I'd say as a small business owner, I didn't feel well represented at the city and I've really, um, strived to better represent small business uh, at the city level. I am in support of reviving the Small Business Advisory Council, and I would love to see the city really invest in businesses that significantly contribute to the fabric of our, our neighborhoods and, and our cultural landscape. Uh, we're really lucky to have what we have. It, is very vulnerable in this moment. And I've been a strong advocate for small businesses uh, during this COVID crisis as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maps. Uh, Portland is not a good place uh, for small business at this point, and that's a tragedy. I think one of the things that has made Portland, uh, Portland over the years is that it's, our town has been a great town to start a family and start a business. Um, but frankly, due to uh, failures down at City Hall, uh, um, um, starting a business and running a business and growing a business in Portland has never been more difficult. Uh, Commissioner U. Daly talked about when she was a small business person, she felt like she didn't have a partner in City Hall. And I'll tell you, I've been talking to business owners for the last year, and they tell me that is still the truth. Uh, one of the things that you'll see right now is a shocking um, exodus of businesses out of Portland. Every day I talk to business owners who tell me they are trying to break their lease uh, so they can get out of the city and when their lease expires, they definitely will not re-up. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing uh, proposals to move businesses into Portland, canceled right and left. This is a tragedy. Um, I think one of the things that we can do uh, to make this better is to have members on city council who are responsive uh, to the needs of small business people. I myself have sat on the board of Venture Portland, which is the uh, business association or the umbrella business association for small businesses in, in Portland. So I get it. I've done amazing work uh, with Venture Portland and the business associations out in Park Rose. I look forward to um, furthering that cause when I'm on city council too. Hey, thank you. Take a breath and try this one if you would. You're gonna start us, okay? Portland's climate action plan includes yep. ambitious goals reducing our fossil fuel emissions. What would you do to achieve those goals? Sure, incredibly important question. One of my uh, things I'm deeply disappointed at in city hall leadership right now is that only 25% of the, I, I think our um, environmental goals have actually been implemented and achieved. I wanna change that. One of the things I can promise Portlanders is that when I'm a member of city council, I will hold my bureau accountable for meeting our environmental goals. And I think we can actually take it up a notch. Uh, um, one of the problems in city hall uh, and in the city of Portland with um, accomplishing our, environmental goals is that no one really owns that project. Um, I think that we could do better if we uh, fundamentally reformed uh, the way we do business in City Hall. That's why I want to have a uh, 
direct city uh, council to hire a c uh, city manager coordinate services across city bureaus. One of the things that that manager would do would be to hold all bureaus accountable for implementing our climate action plan. Uh, um, that's the progress we need in order to get our environment clean. That's also the kind of progress we need in order to just have a city that works um, effectively. Portlanders have had to wait far too long for this. Um, and frankly, given the forest fires that we've seen recently and our struggle to find even just a little bit of clean air to breathe, it's time that we take action in those directions. Okay, hey, thank you, Ms. Udeli. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Portland's Climate Action Plan includes ambitious goals, reducing our fossil fuel emissions. What would you do to achieve those goals? Great, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'll start by saying that I've uh, taken a pledge to never accept campaign contributions from uh, the fossil fuel industry. I oppose uh, the expansion of the Zenith uh, facility and recently uh, after representing the interests of Portland and the community and trying to fight for a better uh, rose, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for a better project withdrew my um, support from the I-5 corridor project. Uh, I have relentlessly advanced our climate goals through the Bureau of Transportation. Transportation makes up 40% of our carbon emissions. Uh, so it's a very, it's, it's the largest single contributor. Uh, and that ranges every, from everything from improving our active transportation infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists to, as I mentioned, the Rose Lane project. Uh, it also requires housing to be where people need it, which is close to schools and jobs um, and other amenities. So anti-displacement and affordable housing is actually a critical piece of this conversation about combat combating climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Um, you all obviously will not be working by yourselves. So uh, Ms. Udaley, name one challenge in working in City Hall and with the other commissioners, and how will you handle the challenge? I think the one of the biggest challenges we face is the fact that we cannot meet in a group to discuss anything uh, in a group larger than two uh, without trigger, triggering quorum. And I understand why those rules exist and I don't wanna change those rules, but the kind of shuttle diplomacy that we have to do uh, because we can't meet as a larger group to discuss and deliberate over, over issues, over items that we're developing in our offices uh, can make moving policy incredibly challenging. It can also make it challenging for us to present a unified or develop a unified vision and uh, a unified front. I think that's one of our biggest challenges. We are poised to have the most progressive city council that Portland has ever had in the new year. And I am, I think our number one priority has to be developing that unified vision, taking ownership of the pieces that belong to each of us and learning, learning how to collaborate and coordinate better. It's uh, somewhat a function of our current form of city government, uh, which is another conversation, but I'm really looking forward to, uh, to solving that challenge. Thanks. Mr. Maps. Um, and I want to go build on the last point that the commissioner pointed to, which is our broken form of government. I think if you've ever had to interact with City Hall, you come away with the impression that there's something wrong down there. And there is something wrong down there. And a lot of it, um, you know, it comes from two sources, both leadership and uh, structures. And in terms of structures, one of the things that's holding Portland back is our broken form of government. We are the last city of our size in America to use a commission form of government, which means that, you know, a lot of people think we have a mayor and four 
four members of city council. In practice, we have five mayors, each in charge of a different city bureau. Um, and that's why we fail over and over again at meeting the basic needs of Portlanders. Why does that happen? Because the challenges that we face as a city are complex. That's why they remain to be challenges, which means that if you want to develop an effective policy, one of the things you need to be able to do is to coordinate services across city bureaus. Let's say something like houselessness. At first, you might think houselessness is fundamentally an issue of just giving someone a key to a house. But if you've ever worked with the houseless community as I have, you know, it's much more complex than that. People are homeless because uh, of housing issues and economic issues and mental health issues and often alcohol and drug issues. And that certainly houselessness is a public safety problem too. So if you want to build an effective houselessness program, uh, one of the things you need to do as a city is to be able to come together and coordinate services across city bureaus. I um, mean, this is something which our system is specifically designed to prevent us from doing. It's not a bug. It's actually a feature and it's a dysfunction that it's time that Portland outgrew. Ms. Udaly. Can we, um, this is a little bit, I'm jumping here, but obviously changing city government is an important issue and you also alluded to it. How about we give it another 90 seconds? Is that good? Okay, to sure. Move? So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is an issue I've been really interested in since uh, my race. I have to admit, since I've lived in Portland my entire adult life, I don't know any other system. But I have come to understand how unusual the system is meeting colleagues across the country who are astounded that uh, not only am I a legislator, but I'm an administrator and the kind of power and responsibilities that come with that. The commission form of government dates back to Jim Crow era South. It entrenches incumbents and people uh, with power. We've seen a, a few instances where candidates such as myself and Commissioner Hardesty have been able to uh, rise above that, but I don't think a couple uh, people being elected to city council solves the problem. I'm uh, excited about the charter review uh, process that we are about to begin and looking forward to their recommendations. I absolutely support a change of um, change in the form of government with both districts and at large uh, commissioners and just would like to add that we can't hire a city manager until we change that form of government and that will have to go to a vote by the people of Portland it's something that my opponent talks about a lot, and I think um, it needs some clarity. Thank you. Okay, and I went out of order, but Mr. Maps, how about another 90 seconds on changing the city government? Oh, sure. Well, I, again, I can... Um, um, I think that the incumbent and I are in agreement on this. I think there might be a very technical discussion that she and I could have that around uh, the mechanisms around hiring a city manager. I agree the best way to do that is through charter reform. I do believe that council could come together as a group and decide this is how we plan to organize ourselves to hire a city manager to coordinate services. And since a majority of council seems to think that's a good idea, this is a move that we could just move forward with right away and make our city, you know, 30% better uh, uh, um, after our next council session. And frankly, given the uh, enormous challenges we face as a community, it really is time for council to look inwards, to ask itself why Portlanders are so disappointed in the leadership and the products that have been put out by city government. Part of it has to do with the fact that we just haven't been able to deliver to Portlanders who need it most. Um, I think that we um, can do that by reforming our form of government, uh, both by hiring a city manager and um, as I think the commissioner alluded to, I'm um, increasing the number of seats on council. Uh, right now we have four seats. It's been that way since 1913, if I recall correctly. In 1913, we had 200,000 people in Portland. Today we have 700,000 people in Portland and still just four uh, members of city council. Um, I think that we would have a more responsive government, a smarter government, and a more representative government, and a more trusted government if we increase the number of seats on city council and filled those seats through neighborhood-based elections. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask you this one next. Um, and the topic really comes as the last couple of words. So it's about the police. Okay. Give you the heads up there. But the question is, describe how you would change, if at all, the current responsibilities of the frontline members of the Portland Police Bureau. 
Sure. Well, I think there are some tactical things. In some ways, you're asking me, what would I do if I were a police chief, I think, uh, or a police commissioner? And definitely, I think there's leadership uh, that we need to, um, uh, leadership changes that we need to have there. I want to see a ban on chokeholds. I want to see a ban on tear gas. I want to see a ban on, um, I want to see a ban on rubber bullets. Uh, one of the things that breaks my heart is that the city, uh, especially the police department, has gotten out of the um, business of doing uh, outreach or even kind of a lot of crime solving. Uh, um, so I can tell you, I, every day I hear about um, drug houses or people in need or commute or neighborhoods uh, um, struggling with uh, um, dire problems. Um, and there's literally no one left in the police bureau to help them uh, solve these issues. I think that's terrifying. Um, and I think that uh, uh, um, we need to reorient our police department and our approach to public safety. So it um, focuses in on, you know, protecting human dignity, uh, um, crime prevention and rehabilitation. Thank you, Ms. Udaly. And this question was about reducing the scope of police work, correct? Um, it was just, how would you change the current responsibility of frontline members? Sure, thank you. Uh, well, I absolutely support uh, reducing and limiting the scope of our police force. We began that work in uh, the budget uh, decision where we eliminated a number of specialty units. As a transportation commissioner, I've been looking into what, what it would take to move traffic enforcement away from police and into uh, the Bureau of Transportation. I'm an enthusiastic supporter of Portland Street response. I mean, we're, we have made the mistake of over-investing in police for years and years while under-investing in the root causes of crime and other social ills that we have left uh, the police to deal to deal with. It, it's uh, not a reasonable task to have given to them. It is not a uh, just or humane way to run our city. And it has led to truly tragic results for many uh, community members. Uh, so it's going to be a ongoing conversation with community. What do we want and need police to do for us? And what, what functions could be better served uh, by other agencies? And I'm, I'm really excited to have that conversation. We've already begun transforming crime prevention uh, to a community safety focus in civic life, the kind of work that community is uh, demanding in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Let's switch a little bit. Um, Ms. Udaly, you'll start us with, Portland has a severe shortage of housing units affordable to our lowest income residents, which is a significant factor in the homeless or houseless crisis. How would you address the shortfall? Thank you for the question. Yes, I think it's um, important to emphasize we do not have a short of shortage of housing units. We actually have thousands and thousands of empty uh, housing units, but we do have a shortage of uh, units affordable to people who are low and extremely low income. We also have a shortage of units to people who are average income. It now takes 120% of the median family income to afford average rents in Portland, uh, which is truly mind blowing. My earliest work on city council was to pass the relocation ordinance, which helped stabilize tens of thousands of, renter, uh, thousands of renters in their existing housing and give them a fighting chance of relocating in the neighborhoods of their choice by requiring landlords to share in the burden that they're creating, not just on their tenants, but really on our whole city uh, by no cause evicting or em economically evicting their tenants. So uh, I have supported a number of measures and items that have led to an increase in production of affordable housing. I'm now turning my attention to anti-displacement methods, including a tenant opportunity to purchase program so we can help low-income renters become homeowners and truly put down roots in their community. Uh, there's no one solution. We have to come at it from multiple directions, certainly family wage jobs are part of this uh, conversation as well. And I'm out of time. Thank you. 
You don't like me waving at you all the time, huh? Mr. Maps, also for you. A very important question. Uh, um, I think one of the things that we need to do to, in response to our affordability crisis is to protect renters. Um, that's why I'm in favor of some of the ideas that we see in um, the Portland Tenants Protection Ordinance. Um, I also support extending the uh, eviction moratorium until um, we have passed this economic crisis. I think it's important that the city uh, devote every spare federal dollar it gets uh, uh, um, to um, put it into an emergency housing fund so folks um, are able to stay in their rental homes. Uh, um, I also think that the city needs to do a better job or at least even begin to get into the business of actually developing real displacement plans. Uh, this is something we always promise but never deliver on. Um, and then I think we need to uh, I'll double down on our commitment to having zero tolerance for racism in our housing markets. Um, and then after that, I think there's some important things we do. One of the, uh, one of the things that I've learned uh, over the course of this campaign is that, um, you know, you can't really build affordable housing in Portland because uh, land prices are so expensive. So we need to uh, preserve the affordable housing that we uh, have. Uh, we have nearly half a billion dollars in housing bonds dollars out there. Uh, um, right now, we're paying at least a quarter million dollars for every affordable house that those dollars are bringing online. I think we need a better stewardship of those dollars in order to dig our way out of the 29,000 affordable housing units that we are short. Thank you, Breathe. And there's been references, as both of you have spoken, to transportation issues. But Mr. Maps, what do you see as the biggest transportation issue and what would you do to address it? Oh, uh, well, first, I think the main issue we have to focus in on transportation has to deal with cleaning up our environment and doing something about um, doing something about traffic congestion. Um, I desperately want to get people out of their cars so we can clean the air and also uh, speed our commuting lines. Uh, so we don't spend an hour trying to get to and home from work back in back uh, uh, when we eventually get to go uh, to and from work. Um, I do support um, pieces of the, of the transportation bond. I think that'll bring some transportation equity to our friends who live in East Portland. Um, I also think I don't support uh, expanding the highway, but I do support building uh, public transportation or rather a train to uh, Vancouver. Um, that way we can take care of some of the congestion that we see there without investing in fatter highways. And in general, I want to reinvent our um, our infrastructure spending, so it focuses in on green infrastructure as opposed to the old fossil fuel infrastructure. And Ms. Udaly. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, what's the biggest transportation issue for Portland and, what would, and how would you address it? Uh, I would characterize the biggest transportation issue for Portland as uh, our inequitable uh, system. We have seen mass displacement of communities of color and low income renters over the last 20 years. Many of those households have been pushed out to the edges of our community where there is inadequate transportation infrastructure and inadequate public transit. So they're having to fight their way back into the central city where most of our jobs are, um, creating congestion and incurring significant cost. So again, uh, there's no one answer or simple solution. It is, it's going to require really a holistic look at, at our entire system and what's going wrong. So I worked the last 18 months on that Metro uh, measure that's coming up on the November ballot. I've endorsed it and I'm very excited about uh, the corridors we've identified. Uh, we need to fight displacement, build affordable housing uh, close to jobs. We need a much more robust transit system and we need to introduce transportation demand management uh, techniques such as congestion pricing. Uh, these are all issues that I'm actively engaged in and uh, really excited to get to help shape the future of our city in this way. Thank you. Thank you. And don't go away because let's go back to the police. Ms. Udaly, um, does the police department's use of force policy need to change? And if so, how? Uh, it absolutely needs to change. 
Uh, we are somewhat encumbered by the current DOJ settlement, as Commissioner Hardesty and I found out, as we have tried to advance a munitions restrictions ordinance in response to some of the very troubling behavior that we've seen um, to the protests with the indiscriminate use of tear gas and other less lethal munitions that are against uh, majority peaceful protesters that have caused grave harm to individuals and actually have unknown health consequences. Uh, so we are going to be navigating that over the next few months, uh, changing the definition of a riot, which is currently five people. Um, uh, you know, I don't have I don't have more specifics about changing use of force. I just know that there's something very wrong when police can shoot an unarmed man in the back or beat a mentally ill man to death on the street and those officers face no consequences or discipline. Our biggest obstacle to change is the Portland Police Union, uh, which happens to be my opponent's biggest contributor. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mapps. Uh, yeah, I do think that there's some important changes that need to uh, make. I would, right off the bat, I would ban uh, the use of chokeholds, ban the use of rubber bullets, ban the use of uh, tear gas. I think it's also important to get the police department out of the business of being first responders for our mental health issues. Uh, most of the shootings that we see in Portland are a product of the police um, intervening on someone who's having a mental health crisis in public. Um, we can cut those in half if we get the police out of that business. That's why I support uh, redirecting funds from the police department to innovative um, um, healing oriented strategies like uh, the street response teams, which will uh, send mental health providers out to deal with someone who's having a mental health crisis instead of sending out a cop, which is like sending out a Marine to deal with someone who is going through a crisis. Uh, steps like that can dramatically reduce uh, the number of shootings that we see. It can make our police department um, a force for um, helping people and helping people heal as opposed to hurting people. Um, I th also think that um, it's important that we as a community um, embrace, you know, Commissioner Hardesty's proposals to reinvent, um, uh, reinvent how we hold police accountable. I'll be voting for that. And one of the reasons why I'm excited to be on council is to help fill in the details for what that's going to look like. I always think that it's important that we have a zero tolerance policy towards um, racism in our police department and our policing program. So I think that we need to audit every program for the impact it has on African Americans. And if we see an unfair, disproportionate impact on people of color, we need to do something different. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask you to continue. Slightly different take here. Instead of looking directly at an issue, name two skills that each of you has that best qualifies you for the position of city commissioner. Me? Yep. You go okay, wait a second. I, I'm glad you asked this question. I've actually been a city hall watcher for a long time, and I think the skills that are so associated with success in city hall are actually quite clear. Um, if you want to be successful in city hall, you have to be a good bridge builder, because in order to pass anything, you at least need at least two more votes. Uh, um, you have to be a um, good city manager uh, or a good manager, because each member of city council is the chief operating officer of at least one city bureau. And you need to be a, um, a good leader listener. Uh, uh, and those are all skills that I have, um, frankly, in spades. Um, um, I'm a bridge builder, which is signaled by the fact that more than 150 individuals and organizations have supported us and endorsed us, uh, um, everyone from labor to big business, uh, to small business, to farmers, to, um, uh, to professors. Um, I also think that it's uh, I'm quite, I also think that um, uh, I have proven myself to be uh, an honorable public servant who has made um, the bureaus I've worked for better, more responsive, and I've always respected uh, um, every citizen who's come through the door asking for my help, and they still ask for my help. That's one of the reasons why I'm in this race today. And I'm a good listener, uh, um, because listening is part of learning, and I'm a lifelong learner. Um, I think that contrasts with uh, the incumbent, who is famous for being more of a bridge burner than a bridge builder. Um, the crises and scandals at Civic Life are a sign of the challenges she's facing in terms of uh, being a good manager. And, um, and we'll leave it at that. 
and Ms. Udaly, the skills, um, two were specific ones that uh, suit you for the position. Sure. Well, I would say that my list of endorsers and uh, the community members and organizations that have come together time and time again to support, uh, to support my policymaking efforts uh, demonstrate that I am, in fact, um, a good bit bridge builder and I have strong relationships with, with colleagues and, and community. Um, I have been really moved by some of the people who have been willing to come to the table and, and support my work because they're people that have um, very legitimate issues with city government and uh, deep concerns and skepticism born out of a lifetime of discrimination and disappointment. And I'm really uh, heartened by the work that, that we've been able to do with those communities. Uh, skill is throwing me off a little bit. I mean, I would say, unlike my opponent, I have, I do have very strong uh, values and principles that d drive my decision making. I'm two things people say about me over and over again. I'm the same person in every room. I am not. I do not try to cater to to different groups and and hedge and uh, try to make everyone happy. I was elected to lead the city and that's what I'm determined to do. Thank you. And thank you. And don't go away because, um, are you satisfied, Ms. Udaly, with the process of electing Portland city commissioners? And if not, how would you change it? Satisfied with the process? I mean, um, I was tempted to ask both of you a more general question about the government and uh -huh. you've already alluded both of you to, sure. to with it. Uh, how about take any part of government and how would you make it better? Feasible oh. better. <laughs> I think I'll stick with the first question. Okay. <laughs> you have your choice. <laughs> uh, so the process of elections, yeah, it's challenging because these are at-large seats, so it's a citywide election. That is a lot of ground to cover. That's a lot of money to raise. Um, it also feels very haphazard uh, as far as who organizes events and how they are held and what the rules are. I've experienced a lot of um, kind of unfortunate situations where groups are actually violating their uh, nonprofit status by favoring a candidate, uh, one candidate over another. Um, I think uh, I've been disappointed in some of the endorsement processes, which uh, are do not feel legitimate or are entirely non-existent. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of favoritism and uh, kind of baggage behind some of these endorsements. And, and that's been interesting to me. I mean, I'm still a relative newcomer. I came from outside of the political world. I've only been here for four years. And since my focus has been on communities that are underrepresented and un underserved, um, I haven't necessarily developed uh, relationships with, with the you know, big powerful players. I wasn't in my opponents endorsed by the Portland Business Association, the Portland Police Association, and is heavily supported uh, by the landlord lobby. These are all entities that um, would like to see me gone. And I encourage you to think about why. Thank you, Mr. Maps. Hello, uh, thank you for that important question. Can you hear me? Yes, I think I can. Um, you know, it's been a really interesting, I'm, I'm not a professional politician, this is my first race, um, and every minute of it has been fascinating. Um, it's been life transforming as like almost anything that you can do. Like it's, I, I think about what comparisons of my life would be like and maybe having a kid. Uh, it's just something that literally just changes your perspective on the world. Um, and I'm stepping into uh, Portland politics at a unique time in history and frankly, it's one of the reasons why I stepped in at this time, uh, Portland has uh, just created a program for public financing for campaigns. Um, and I'm participating 
participating in that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm participating in that. I'd never take on, I'd never run for office if there weren't public uh, financing. And I certainly would never take on an incumbent uh, um, if there weren't uh, um, tools like uh, public financing. And here's what public financing uh, means. Um, in my race, it means that I can only accept donate, I can't accept cash donations from unions, PACs, or businesses. I can only take uh, hard dollars from individuals. Uh, um, and uh, no donation I can take uh, can be over 250 bucks, except for this little pot of money that you start up with. Literally, the largest uh, donation I've taken in the course of this campaign has been 500 bucks, I think. Um, it really forces you to get out, uh, work the streets, talk to people, meet people. Um, it's been an enormous... Um, privilege, uh, and I, I wouldn't change anything. First time through there, some bumps. I think uh, we discovered a couple of just underdeveloped uh, parts of the process, and we'll fix those as we get past this election. Thank you. Okay, here's another one. Mr. Maps, you're going to start us on. Many surveys and reports have documented declining trust in the democratic institutions in our country. Do you agree? And if so, what would you do to rebuild trust? Oh gosh, I, I see this every day. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm in this race. Um, I've never seen Portlanders more disillusioned and disappointed um, at uh, their elected leaders that, that, than they are right now. I think part of that has to do with leadership. Um, a part of that has to do with institutional um, challenges and changes that need to be made. Uh, one of the things I would do um, um, to make this different is to run for office and try to bring a different set of values to the table. I believe in listening to people. I believe in cooperation. I believe in um, honoring pe pe people's humanity and their right to be different from me. Um, at the same time, I also believe that the way we get good public policies is by bringing everyone to the table, eliciting their best ideas, and then um, working together to build solutions that fit Portland. I also think that we could do, um, we could build public trust by changing our form of government. I think one of the reasons people are so alienated from a Portland city government is because it has failed them so much. One of the ways that we can fix that is moving towards uh, increasing the number of seats on council so that you have a more direct relationship with your member of city council. And maybe if some like young person uh, wants to run for office, they could actually you know, win that neighborhood seat without having to you know, turn their life um, over uh, on its head for a year. Um, those are some of the changes I'll make. I think it'll result in better decisions. I think it'll bring people closer to their government. Um, and I hope to um, um, model um, a, tie, a kind of leadership um, and a kind of kindness that will um, get Portland back to where we used to be. Ms. Udaly. Well, this certainly isn't a Portland uh, problem. It's a national issue. Uh, and I would say the decline of a free press and the uh, explosive growth and influence of social media has actually had a huge impact on how um, polarized we are as a country right now. I also think it's really prob problematic that we no longer have a true paper of record. Uh, it is very challenging to get accurate, timely information out to the public so they can understand what is happening uh, in their communities and with their city government, and they can make informed decisions. Uh, I was an advocate for the city to have a communications office to try to help uh, combat these challenges. It's another uh, issue with uh, not having a unified voice. We don't even have a communications office, but um, not all of my colleagues supported that. Um, I would say, you know, we have to restore faith in our electoral process. Oregon is doing a great job at that. We have to get big money out of elections, which I'm also participating in the Open and Accountable Elections Program, uh, which, yes, you can only uh, accept money from individuals, but you can accept contributions from others. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and candidates, I need to thank both of you for your adherence to timing. Uh, we've asked you for big issues in 90 seconds, so I appreciate that. Take a deep breath. It's time to turn to our closings. 
And Ms. Yu Daly, you'll start us off with your closing, please. In closing, I'll just say that since taking my seat, I've prioritized equity, inclusion, and racial justice in all of my policymaking. I've passed the strongest protections Portland renters have had since World War II, helping to pave the way for the state to enact stronger protections. I was an early supporter of the Portland Clean Energy, uh, Portland Clean Energy Fund, the only sitting commissioner to endorse it, and I've crafted some of the strongest environmental policies in the country. I've prioritized equity, safety, and climate goals in my transportation work, including fixing our streets and safe routes to school. And this year I launched the Rose Lane project, which I discussed earlier. I've also helped lead the city's COVID response, prioritizing BIPOC communities, renters, people with disabilities, small business owners, and our arts community while striving to close the digital divide <clears throat> and create new ways for meaningful civic engagement during a time when we can't gather together in person. I'm inspired by what we've been able to accomplish working hand in hand with the community, and I'm excited to continue that work in my next term. Both my endorsements and the notable coalitions that have formed to support my work for renters protections to, from renters protections to civic engagement to transportation speaks to the relationships I've built over the past four years. I've led transformational change at all of my bureaus, and I'm a proven quick study no matter what the assignment. Again, thank you for having us today. And uh, you can learn more about my campaign at votechloe.com. I would be honored to receive your vote this November. Thank you, Mr. Maps. You're closing. Well, I just want to thank you for hosting uh, this important event, and I want to thank the incumbent for uh, engaging in this vigorous discussion with me. And I want to ask, and I want to thank everyone who's tuning in uh, for paying attention to this important election. And I will point out, this is one of the most important elections in our lifetime. I, and I want to ask you to think about what you are looking for in a successful member of city council. Came up earlier in our discussions, I think that uh, successful members of city council share at least three characteristics. They're bridge builders because they need to uh, uh, pull together at least three votes to pass anything. They have to be good city administrators because each member of the city council is also the COO of a major city bureau. Um, and to be a good city uh, councilor, you also need to be a good listener because that's how democracy works. One of the arguments in this campaign is the observation that the incumbent fails on all three of those schools. The politics are about burning bridges, not building them. Uh, the scandals over at the Office of Civic Life emphasize the challenges and frankly, leader failures in her leadership. And let me ask you, if you've ever had a meeting with Commissioner Udini, did you come away from that session feeling heard? Me, on the other hand, I'm a lifelong and proven bridge builder. That's evidenced by the fact that more than 151 uh, individuals and organizations have endorsed us. I'm a good administrator, which is evidenced by the, uh, uh, um, my deep experience. Uh, I'm uh, operating in management roles throughout uh, local government here in Portland. And I'm a good listener and a lifelong learner. Um, and I believe that if we work together, we can build the kind of Portland we want. I think that we can build safe, healthy, empowered neighborhoods. I think we can end chronic homelessness. I think we can build more affordable housing. We can reinvent policing. We can embrace growth and diversity while also protecting our environment. If you believe in these things too, please vote Mengus Maps for City Council. And if you want to learn more about my campaign, please go to our website, mengusmaps.com. Thank you very much. And thank you. And my thanks to both of the candidates for your cooperation. And audience members, please share this forum with other family and friends and know as well that this is one piece of information. You can certainly have others that you will be able to access before election day because we all need to be informed voters. This recording and other information about these candidates will be on vote411.org throughout or it's up to election day. You should receive your ballot around October 14th. As with all Oregon elections, it is mail-in only. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd. Postmarks do not count. Mail them by October 27th to ensure they are received or use one of the drop-off locations that are around the area. And again, you can go to vote411.org to find out some of those locations. 
Again, I'm, my name is Linda Mather for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. And please continue to be an informed voter and help others, your friends, your families, your neighbors, encourage them to vote. Your vote, everyone's vote counts. Thank you.